Welcome to the B2B Category Creators Podcast, hosted by Gil Alouche, founder and CEO of Metadata.io. This podcast is all about sharing the real and sometimes edgy secrets of B2B software creation. On today's episode, we have Kyle York, CEO and co-founder of York IE, and Tom Wentworth, CMO at Recorded Future. Welcome to the Category Creators Podcast. My name is Gil Alves. I'm the founder and CEO of Metadata. I have to be with me Tom Wentworth and Kyle York. Uh, maybe we'll start with the introduction first. Kyle, perhaps you can give a quick introduction on yourself. Great. Uh, thanks for having me, Gil. Excited to be here. Uh, so I'm Kyle York. I'm CEO and co-founder of York IE. We're a strategic growth and investment firm. I'm actually, a proud investor in Metadata. So this is, this is going to be fun. And I'm just really excited. I, a lot of my experience has been as a chief revenue officer, and a general manager. I helped build a company called Dyne uh, to 100 million ARR and a successful exit to Oracle and spent a few years uh, learning the ropes in Oracle and uh, now back working with startups where I belong. Uh, so really enjoying it and excited to be here. Awesome. Very nice having you, Kyle, and very happy that you're an investor and an advisor at Metadata. Very proud to have you. Tom, maybe you can uh, do an intro next. Yeah, my name is Tom Wentworth. I'm the chief marketing officer at a company called Recorded Future. We're an intelligence company in the cybersecurity industry. We help our customers defend themselves at the speed of the adversary. There's lots of bad threat actors out there looking to to damage and steal. And we help our customers um, with intelligence so that they can make better security decisions faster incredibly cool company. I had no background in cybersecurity, so it's been a MBA course learning from some of the smartest minds in the world. About a 32-person marketing team. We're about $150 million in ARR and, and in a pretty exciting journey. Very cool. And we just talked about it a little bit before. I, I know Chris, Christopher Arberg, who is the, who's the founder of Recorded Future and of Spotfire, which, which I interned 10 years ago. And uh, so very excited about that context, exchanging some stories. Uh, it's very interesting to hear how Recorded Future really grew quite extensively. So all the things that, uh, that maybe didn't happen with Spotfire happened with Recorded <laughs> Future. So that's, uh, that's exciting. Yeah, I've heard the stories of of Spotfire and a good example of where we, we, we underestimate marketing, something I'm sure we'll talk about. Spotfire was a classic example of the best product didn't win the market. The best marketing won the market. And I think the best marketing in this case was Tableau. And it's I think it's a shame. Agreed, but sounds like a recorded future. You you had the redemption and, and did all of that and more. Well, I don't know if I did it, but uh, I think Christopher has learned his lesson the hard way. And certainly we are marketing led, as we like to say here. So, Well, and actually Tom and I, uh, we're both New Hampshire guys. Uh, so we both grew up in the live free or die state of New Hampshire. And so we have that uh, kinship, but also uh, we shared investors. Uh, Dines Investor was a firm, Northbridge, that's yeah. now called Guidepost. And when Tom was CMO of Acquia, uh, you know, the, the, the Drupal uh, with Dries and, you know, uh, uh, the content, you had a long career in content management systems, right? So we, we actually go back even to maybe my Whipple Hill days in private yeah. schools. So and we've, we, we've known each other a very long time and have like been longtime collaborators and taking like technologies that no one understands and helping, <laughs> helping <laughs> uh, translate them to business value props for the market, right? Yeah. I'm very and much having a- fun at parties and stuff too and drinking together. <laughs> I'm looking forward to these, to these stories. I want a, f- a, few, uh, a few stories at least. Uh, sounds like you spent at least one or two decades uh, knowing each other. So please <laughs> do bring some skeletons out of the closet. Uh, first and foremost, do everyone have drink with them? Yes. Yes. Thank you, by the way. That's very, I mean, what a, what a awesome. setup here. I mean, I was like, I'm trying I to do it, it in one sitting. I have literally <laughs> about this after this, so I'll try not to. Be too boozy when I go there. Please do. Please, definitely, please do. Uh, what are you drinking, Tom? I got uh, Rebel IPA. Nice. All right. I'm going. Classic. All right. Sounds good. I'm just drinking some rum here. I'm in Dominican Republic, so that's the national drink. Awesome. Um, category creation is the big topic for this uh, for this podcast, and the reason is that we're trying to create one at Metadata, and we wanted to not make all the possible mistakes that founders and CEOs and, and, and executive teams make uh, when they think about category creation, like sit together in a room and try to come up with some words and then uh, push it into the, the analysts and, and market. So we really are trying to learn from the best in class, companies who've done it or companies who've decided against it uh, and their experiences. So maybe we'll start there. Uh, Tom, maybe you can go 
first. You, you just talked about Spotfire and how they didn't invest enough in marketing, how they had the best product in class, which I completely agree with. Um, but someone else defined the category and someone else led it. Yeah. Um, how, was, how was it in Recorded Future? And when you joined, was it top of mind uh, from day one? Like, tell us a little bit of, uh, of your thoughts about it in the context of Recorded Future. I think there's been two iterations. So Recorded Future... In its earliest days, Christopher and Stefan, his co-founder, their hypothesis was, and the name tells you what the company was built to do, it was built to record the future like a DVR for the internet. The initial belief was that this approach would allow them to go to hedge funds and, and sell to quants and, hey, we can help you predict the future by recording it. And that didn't work particularly well. I think they got some customers what they realized was being able to scrape the internet, being able to contextualize the information they were collecting turned out to be incredibly valuable from a security perspective. It was sort of like having a mini NSA or CIA quality data set inside your organization. So the category that Recorded Future pioneered was called threat intelligence. And this is gathering intelligence about threats that exist on the internet, sometimes in the open web, sometimes in the dark web, but we would help understand that. And we created that category and that category got Recorded Future to be you know, up to about a $100 million company, but we didn't believe that that category was gonna be big enough for our aspirations. So the journey we're on now is, is broadening from threat intelligence to just intelligence. So we are very much, we, you know, we are a cybersecurity company. We operate in the cybersecurity world. We are trying to carve out intelligence as just like you have firewalls, just like you have endpoint, just like you have SIMs. Now we think you have intelligence and we've broadened our support for different use cases beyond just threat intelligence to uh, SecOps intelligence, vulnerability intelligence, third-party intelligence, uh, fraud uh, intelligence. And that's my challenge now is taking a company that pioneered a specific category and now taking that one step broader. That's cool. Let's take a pause there for a second. Uh, you did put a, an unshameful sales pitch in there. I'm going to ask you to drink for a second. I'm going to well. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you for that. I'll do it too. I'll do it too. It's definitely a sales pitch, but I don't suspect this audience is going to be comprised of CISOs and the no. analysts. So <laughs> no way. I feel You're right. like that's, I feel like I, you know, I feel like I had that right. You definitely had that right. That's cool. Uh, and it's very interesting. So you said that you did think about category creation from the get-go and you pioneered uh, the, the, I think you call it threat, uh, threat, threat intelligence. intelligence. Yeah. But after you created that and achieved very significant uh, market share or, or market, uh, market leadership, you actually said, uh, this is not enough. Like, we can do much more. Yeah. So if you look at the, at the initial, like, how did that come about? Like, did you find, did you find yourself alone in that threat intelligence? Did you look at the company like Palantir or like, I don't know, Cato? Like, like how, yeah, how did that come it's about? It's a good question. So we, we were not, we, we started alone. I would say over the, the years, Point Solutions came into our market, companies much smaller than Recorded Future. But we, you know, we have threat intelligence competitors. There's a threat intelligence Forrester wave. Um, and, and, you know, we pioneered the category, other people came in, but we wanted to to expand our TAM and, and expand our vision. And we sort of felt like the market was taking us in this direction. And we sort of just eliminated the word threat to our platform. But this is clearly category creation. Analysts don't get us. And we should talk about this. We struggle with analysts. We, we have a very different opinion of this market than they do. And we've been sort of vocal about having a different opinion. And it sort of puts us in an interesting spot. That is very interesting. I definitely want to hear about your opinion about analysts. Um, <laughs> Kyle, you, maybe you can tell us a little bit. You, you have a lot yeah. of experience in CRO and then um, what is your thought about character creation? Always a good idea, not always a good idea. And uh, you know, what, what's your work with lots of founders these days? Like how do you, yeah. what, what's your recommendation? Well, listen, I think I, I, we see two types of companies now in my currency. We see companies with like enormous visions, like sort of boil the ocean concepts that are like trailblazing and then like kind of like hard to believe plans to get there. You know, it's kind of like, hmm, like, okay, I see this $12 billion TAM and blah industry name that you just made up, but like, how are you going to like unlock, you know, opportunity along the path towards that market, addressable market, right? Um, 
And so, you know, then we see the second is we see like a lot of niche players or like vertical SaaS players or players with maybe smaller um, visions, but very clear execution plans of how they might be able to get the 10 to 20 to 30 to 50 million in revenue. But then you're like, I don't, I don't see a big vision beyond that. So now what the heck are you going to do? And so I think that's the way we see it. And clearly the best companies are the ones who have the big vision and then can also walk it back and say, these are the things that we're going to do along that journey to unlock the next phase of the opportunity. And, and part of that's really like, like very um, comparative to our dying journey. You know, like when I joined in 2008, I mean, our, our space was the managed DNS space, the domain name system space. And, you know, the DNS is an internet protocol and you can get <laughs> free DNS um, from open source or from GoDaddy when you buy a domain name or network solutions or donuts or you name it. And we created this sort of enterprise space where it was better, you know, it was faster, it was more secure it had SLAs attached to it. But like, we really, really struggled with ever capitalizing the business because people were like, well, there's no market, right? Like, like no one pays for it. Why, how is it going to be monetized? So, you know, whether it was meant to be or not, we actually bootstrapped Dine uh, to 30 million of ARR. We never raised a dollar of outside capital. Uh, we created this, like, I'd say small category of managed DNS. I mean, Tom witnessed this a lot of at the time where he was as a client. We did a lot of partnership work together. We ran the DNS's sexy campaign, which was one of our, you know, we gave away like 30,000 t-shirts to, you know, developers and technical operations folks and NREs and system administrators and over the years. And, and we just said, you know what, like, we're going to be proud of it, even though it might not be big because we're not trying to raise the next capital round or appease investors or appease analysts. But then what happens, like everyone else, you're like, how do you sustain growth? You know, like, how do you, then get to the next level of opportunity. And, and that's where, honestly, we really, really struggled from that. You know, I think we got to like 50 okay with DNS, but and then we tried to figure out like what other adjacencies or complementary products or we, we started to try to position ourselves as internet performance management. And we acquired a monitoring company that actually, that's how I know the recorded future guys. I was a company called Red Assist that did a lot of um, deep, internet data uh, collection and, and for security and DOD and different things. And, you know, it was like, we were always trying to piece it together to create this category. And it wasn't until we sold the Oracle where I realized, you know, it was really just cloud infrastructure and cloud infrastructure platforms had lots of parts and products and feature set. And, you know, really what we probably were was more next generation network performance management, which was already a massive multi-billion dollar category. And it wasn't until like the last six months of Dyn independence did we switch to next gen network performance management. And when we did that, everyone bought it because, you know, people use next gen a lot, but like in infrastructure, there really is like a binary legacy versus new. <laughs> um, it's very different than a lot of other spaces. It's not like your space, Gil, where it's like, ABM versus autonomous demand gen, like in their, they're like all been founded in the last decade. In my world, you know, a lot of the infrastructure stuff, it's, it is technology from the eighties and nineties that still persists. Right. So anyway, that's the kind of way I look at it. It's the unlocking of the next wave in, in, in Tom hit it. It's about expanding your addressable market and proving to the world that there's a lot more runway ahead for your ARR group. Yeah. Interesting. So when you differentiated um, the the category creators from the category joiners or whatever it is, um, you you were talking about twelve billion dollars and fifty million dollars in Aaron. So I'm assuming you were you're referring to twelve billion dollars in valuation and fifty million dollars in Aaron. Is that like yes. kind of how you see like the two ceilings? Yeah, I kind of look at it like you know, founders and and operators like they know they're they know how big they could get, right? Like I think. I think at the end of the day, you, you're building an execution engine, right? You, you know the lead capacity, you know the velocity, you know your sales capacity, your quota coverage. Like you kind of know, right? Like, okay, how's this going to go? Like, can we hit these numbers? For us at Dyn, it was kind of like you get to a certain scale and you're like, wow, no one's ever got this big. There aren't that many other players <laughs> monetizing to the same level we are. I don't, and, and all the cloud platforms are launching competitive feature set at 120th the price. It was kind of like, how much bigger can we get, right? So, so our unlocking had to be product adjacencies, right? Not just 
product feature add-on or expansion to the to the core market or product set we were in, right? So I think there's like an unlocking that sort of happens. I think I think it's and it's just being real about what not total addressable market really, but what like what do you really think ARR capture can be for your company? And and you know I think the best operators can kind of see that a year or two uh, before it starts to constrain. Interesting. So you. And, and you you referred a little bit of the ABM or the Martech space, which is super, super busy. And uh, and you were pooping a little bit about it, saying that the legacy and the new one is the, new, is the same. But let's talk about it for a second. We're, as an investor, right? Because you, you're, you invest in many companies today, you have to choose. You look at a founder, maybe uh, let's take a technical founder in my, in my example. I I'm, can actually relate to the, to the bootstrapping um, story uh, because you sometimes maybe know... Um, how it's going to look like a year or two ahead is easy to look, but like five years, like you were talking about the $12 billion story. Some companies, some founders will come up with that story with zero meat, you know, <laughs> right. it's it's completely. Not, doesn't hold water at all. And you have the opposite problem. Do you ever find an invest a founder who like talks a big talk and you're like call bullshit early on? Oh, completely. Like, yeah. I mean, listen, most technical founders or domain experts from a space who decide to go build a product and like are different than, like Tom and I as marketers and can code and maybe build something, you know, like they're always thinking product out. Like, you know, how do I innovate? What, what feature set can I build different? You know, like, like, like how can I bring, you know, unique algorithms or AI or NLP to this, you know, whatever. Very few are thinking very, mar- we call it market in, the market in approach to company building. I mean, Gil, you've heard me say this ad nauseum over the years, but like, but like, you know, we, we think of it as like more a market in approach to company building and like, who are the competitors? Who are the comparators? Who are the legacy players you're trying to displace? Where is the greenfield opportunity? And then what brand and go-to-market motion are you creating to go attack that market opportunity with the product you're building? And then how does the product kind of iterate and evolve to meet the demands of, of the business value prop of that market, right? And, and again, that's like, it may seem so nuanced and subtle, but I can sniff that out so damn fast with founders on how are they viewing the world, right? And like, sometimes I'll be in meetings with founders and I'll name companies from, you know, insert your space. I'll be like, oh, so are you guys like this? I mean, because I mean, we're not geniuses or anything in all these spaces. We're, we're trying to learn quickly, do market and competitive intelligence ourselves. And sometimes I'll name companies that like are very clear competitors and the founder will be, uh, who's that again? Like, they're looking <laughs> it up, you know, and you're like, Dude. and I, and I saw this firsthand. I mean, I reported to a guy at, Oracle who reported to Larry Ellison, right? We were pretty senior after our acquisition. And I remember being in a room once talking about network performance management, uh, the DDI space was, was his DNS, DHCP and IPM. No one would know that who's listening to this. It's very nerdy. Um, but I remember being in a room with like the top engineers in the world who had came from Amazon Web Services to help build Oracle Cloud using, hey, like, so do you want us to go more DDI space or like edge computing or CDN? This is right after the acquisition. Do you want us to be like, more internal network management and like internal operations, you know, management, or do you want us to be more like edge computing, CDN, caching, all the, you know, web security, all this stuff. And it was so funny, like what's DDI? Like NPM, who's Riverbed? I've never heard of that. (laughs) And I remember just thinking it's because they live in this world of like all that matters is AWS, GCP, Oracle, you know, like their only world is what they're building in their bare metal cloud, compute, storage, network, the, the building blocks of cloud. And they're not paying attention to the ecosystem around them that might be ankle biting or being disruptive. So, so again, this is like so common for technical founders or deep domain experts, you know, who come into a space and say, I'm going to build technology to try to solve a big problem. It's really, it's product out, not market it. It's, it's as simple as that. And do you ever face shortly do you, do, you, do you ever short did you ever kind of meet the other way around that you, you meet a founder that is onto something humongous and they're so pragmatic they're so technical they're they're so focused on the solution the innovative solution they came up with that they don't actually see the, the and they focus themselves on something that is already in existence versus seeing the greater yeah area. and yeah totally and, and they're also like engineers tend to be and this is not a knock but you know again they're probably not listening they tend to be more single threaded and like focused and pragmatic to your point. I call it like single threaded versus high throughput, right? Like it's like they, they, they come up with their thing and then they, they get on their task and they operate on their sprints and they execute towards their product roadmap, right? Where like, you know, guys like us might be like, 
consuming information like recording future is across the web scraping everything that's what we're doing mentally and how we think about marketing and markets and go to market models and pricing models and positioning and programs campaigns like we're we're always iterating and evolving and i think the engineer is is trying to stay focused now i have seen engineers by the way who are high throughput problem is they have shiny object syndrome and they just chase bells and whistles and feeds and speeds and you know they don't end up with a cohesive platform right so so it's yeah i mean you see you see it all but uh, you know i always heard like in in venture investors and i wouldn't call us a venture investor i'd call us more like an operator helping operators who happen to sling checks you know um but i've always heard from venture investors the pattern mapping or pattern repetition or you know whatever it's all nonsense right but but there are like little learnings of reading people and reading teams and market opportunities that like you just get good at by talking to thousands and thousands of companies a year interesting uh, Tom you know if you had to go back uh, you know in time and you would be the the CMO for spot fire you know year year four. Uh, year three, year four. How would you, how would you do it differently? Uh, what kind of advice would you give, would you give Chris, uh, Christopher, you know, joining and, and telling them, like knowing what you know now? Yeah, so I'll answer that. And before I get to that, I want to come back to one question you asked, which is, is category creation for everybody? And I think the answer is no. And Tableau is the best example. Tableau didn't create the category. They came into it. They just executed better. So you can win a market by yeah. executing better. Apple doesn't create very many categories. They just fast follow and just out execute you. I think for most companies, category creation will be the way they can break through. But if you've got a team that knows how to really execute, I don't know that it's necessary. And I think, you know, because the downside into it, creating a category is expensive. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes investments that don't pay off for a long time. Um, and it's, it's why you companies have to raise so much venture capital to succeed. So what I would do differently, obviously entirely different world, right? Spotfire was a desktop tool. I can't even imagine what that must've been like. I'm a huge fan of bottoms up adoption. I think that Spotfire was a tool that users loved and frankly, so is Tableau. It's why they've been successful. I would have found a way to get Spotfire in as many people as possible. I would have continued to double down. It's easy to say in hindsight, but Spotfire's focus on specific verticals was a real early wedge. I would have found other problems we could have solved with Spotfire the same way that you all solved it specifically for life sciences. But I would have really focused on bottoms up adoption, which is is something you just didn't even really exist back then. It was called shareware, right? You know what, actually, this is my first time hijacking Gil, sorry. Um, Please. I was, I was thinking a lot, like you have so much experience from co- the content management system industry, CMS, oh gosh. and like the way that market, like, 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 would you have ever imagined like the Squarespaces, the Weeblies, even like the e platforms, the Shopify's, like these are really just CMS's for storefronts. Like, 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 can you like, like also like do the same view of like CMS over time? Because talk about like, CRM, CMS, like the two, like almost foundational, you know, market spaces of the internet <laughs> from yeah, my perspective, yeah, yeah. right? Maybe file storage is a third or something. Uh, we're like the earliest software, like, like licensed software became SaaS businesses. You know, I don't know. Just like talk about that evolution. Yeah, I, I think find it's it wild how big these companies are now. Which... It's interesting to me. I mean, so CRM is a space where it's been resistant to innovators dilemma disruption, like you take a shot at the king, you better you better not miss. And right. everyone who's taken a shot has missed wildly. And there haven't been that many people who even have the confidence to take a shot at it. But the CMS space has gone through four or five massive disruptions where just an innovator's dilemma style competitor came in and wiped out a market. Totally. Well, in the CRM thing, the only ones you've seen kind of make a dent are like the like really niche ones, right? Like for realtors or like yeah, financial exactly. advisors or like, exactly. you know, independent consultants. It's like, and then, and then they're all big exits, but they're meaningful to the entrepreneurs, right? They might have a $50 million exit, but it wasn't highly venture capitalized. And, you know, they owned 80% of the company, but you're, you've never seen anyone go, you're right, to, to actually disrupt Salesforce at all. In the right? CMS space, there, you know, there've been multi- billion dollar exits. It's one of the few spaces, you know, you look at most spaces and you say, if you're not, you know, if you're not number one, why bother? 
you can be number three, four, five, and over time, those those things go up and down, and we've still seen successful multi-billion dollar exits in some cases. I think right now that market is in for another one of those disruptions through consumer tools. Like you said, yeah. the, the one thing that always wins in the end is can our tools easy enough to be used? Do people adopt them? Can they deliver value quickly? And in the CMS space, you spend half a million dollars and six months later, you might get something. You can build a Wix site or a Squarespace site tomorrow. Webflow. Webflow, Webflow I mean, is it's just, gorgeous. It's unbelievably easy. You're talking about CRM. Uh, it's interesting because it's exactly right. It's an absolute truth that no one can touch Salesforce, right? And we, we're, we're yet to have Salesforce, but we'll have them. We'll, we'll have one, one soon. And they are the ultimate category winner. They created it, but it's, I, it, I would challenge that it's not because of the product. I, I you know, I, the product no. is, is okay minus, but the, the ecosystem around it, who can touch it? You know? No. I, I, Salesforce is terrible, Gil. Let me tell you a little story. I have a little rant. <laughs> like the fact that Salesforce has leads and contacts, this is something that bothers me to no end. <laughs> If someone could explain the difference to me and the problem with it is there's so much that can go wrong because Salesforce has leads and contacts, it actually makes no sense. And they've lived with this now for what, 15 years? Yeah. I can't tell you how much ops effort goes into reconciling the fact that there are leads and contacts. And it literally is my nightmare. Talk so about you know, it's funny, actually, talk actually about ecosystem. It. Imagine yeah, that you yeah. have an ecosystem. You have to hire a Salesforce ops person to handle the lead to contact so that you can actually build a sustainable. We literally have developers who write triggers in order to convert leads to contacts automatically. But and that if one little thing breaks, our entire engine goes down. It is crazy how fragile it is. You guys will die at this. You guys will die at this now, knowing each other now, but like. Um, when we were building um, Dying, uh, we used sugar, open source sugar CRM, Oof. and it was all customized because our developers could like build a better system than anybody else, right? I came in, we implemented Salesforce. Salesforce was more basic back then, right? Like 2009, 10, whatever. It was so bad, the leads, the contacts, that I just never even measured leads at all. I didn't even <laughs> measure a marketing. It's, if it wasn't an opportunity, it was not measured in the conversion. So there's no MQL to SAL ratios. I was like, screw it. We're not even going to measure leads. Let's talk. Everybody with a website can use our DNS services. Let's build the biggest database possible, right? And market to everyone. And let's not worry about measuring anything until they get in the sales funnel. And maybe that was my CRO brain, right? Who owned it all and was just like, who cares? It's results. Um, but the other thing with Salesforce is like, I, and I don't know what this really is. We use HubSpot at York IE for our, all of our funnel management and it's basic and it's simple and it's whatever. The problem with Salesforce is actually, you know, what, per, what percent of... Uh, of the the power of Salesforce is actually every customer even use, right? Like, I mean, I got to believe it's like 2%, 5%. Tiny. Like no one uses it like for every feature or capability it has. And the only way you could is if you're a huge company who can afford that ecosystem to light it all up. And even then it's just, it's just a ton of noise, right? But it is, to Gil's point, it is the ecosystem. It's the integrations it's the APIs, it's all the things you can do to customize it for some businesses, but it, it's why it's so, it's so intertwined in a business, it can't ever be ripped out. And that's why it's such a- I will say business. Airtable, HubSpot has actually gotten pretty good. Like there are some that are starting to creep yeah. that have never good, been Good there, luck, right? good luck. Yeah, good, good I would luck. say yeah, it's yeah. an operating system for sales, which is yeah. just like what we're trying to do for MarTech. And I would bet, I would put an easy, a uh, thousand dollar bet that the HubSpot CRM has no chance of even, even you know, sneezing at, at that. Yep. At that there's, there's nothing close. But you know, uh, let's talk for a second. You know, you know each other for a while. So, how how many years? Let just like throw a number at me. How, how long have you known each other? For? Probably been about ten years, nine years, something like that. Yeah, okay, so this least. is not as damaging as I hoped it to be. Um, I would like you to tell me, uh, Kyle. Let's start with you. A story about Tom that no one knows. Well, okay, I got one. Um, so Tom, myself, Tom, and Mike Volpe, uh, who's actually been on your show. Yep, um, I had Mike here. Uh, hey, Mike yeah, told Mike, me, by the way, Mike's, Mike's embarrassing story was vomiting on, a, on his date, on a double date in Boston. So. Oh, geez. oh well, I mean, I don't have anything like too fun, you know, really here. But, but before, while I was at Dine, while Mike was at HubSpot, and while Tom was at Acquia, um, we used to get together for scotches and whiskeys and drinks nice. in Boston. 
And we actually talked about creating a exactly what York IE is basically um, <laughs> called Operator VC together, yeah. the three of us. Um, and uh, Mike ended up leaving HubSpot. Uh, you know, uh, Tom wanted a few more bats, right? I uh, went to Rapid Minor after Acquia, right? And yep. then and then to Recorded Future. And Diane ended up getting acquired. And I was sort of last man standing from our C-suite and sort of like, you know, I'm glad it happened this way, but I ended up becoming the GM inside Oracle for three years, managing the PL. And so it's kind of funny because a lot of the vision we had, I want to say both even bought like operator.bc, like, yeah. uh, you know, domain names. And, and so we were always talking about like, man, why couldn't, you know, again, there's lots of former operators who are, who are in investments in venture capital. They work for Sequoia or Andreessen or General Catalyst. There's very few, um, firms that are creating companies with services and a platform we're building. We're going to actually launch in May, our market competitive intelligence SaaS platform. We'll get you guys in the beta and playing with it. Um, private company database, uh, markets, database, news. Uh, it's going to be awesome. And you know, we're just trying to create all these different vehicles to help accelerate strategic growth for startups. Sorry, I should drink because that's kind of a sales pitch. It's that's not meant right. to be a sales pitch. Cheers, it is, but it's okay. Cheers. It kind of is. But you know, again, it was, it's really about can you create a company that's operators helping operators that brings about the weight of the company. I'm 22 people, right? Like that's like, if I was a seed fund, I'd be like myself and EA and a dog. Right. Um, and so we're really investing in the human capital, the technology infrastructure um, to help operators accelerate their growth. And hopefully by the time they raise that big A or big B round, they're far more mature because they've been able to get that, get that expertise and also not get that expertise in the cheap seats. Right. So I'm like, None of us ever wanted to be like the retired guys who sat on boards and showed up once a quarter and told everybody how it used to be when we were operating <laughs> companies. Oh, so what right. I love about York IE, I mean, we're chasing down 3 million ARR. Uh, we're at about 2.7 million ARR. And we didn't launch any of our monetizable services till June yeah. of last year, right? So, so I'm going to build a big company that is also an investor. And I think that comes from a lot of the early conversations we had, Tom, uh, with yeah. Volpe. I'll Wait, give you a cool. What stops from, sorry, Tom, just before you tell me, I hope you have a great story. He has a better Kyle. one, probably. I do. Uh, I have a really but, good one. <laughs> but what stops you from, from hiring, uh, not hiring, but getting Tom and Mike Volpe immediately to, to call York? Why is this like a nostalgic story without the happy ending? You know, um, I, will say, I will say that Volpe and Wentworth's current venture capital firms can afford to pay them a lot more than Kyle York, uh, you know, family office, right? Uh, you know, no, I mean, I think we've talked about it. I told you these guys all both want one more office. They're going to be great investment partners and advisors with uh, with uh, York IE with one more exit. And I'm, you know, I'm considering moving pretty close to Kyle, like where I could, you know, ride my bike over and uh, grab a drink. So stay tuned. Well, let's, yeah, they let's will stay be invested just like you, Gil, when metadata has some big IPO or some splashy exit. You guys will all be investment partners and advisors exactly. with York IE. Love it. So here's my story. So Kyle's a pretty cool dude, in case you haven't noticed. Like he's, you know, close sort of like casting call hipster, loves Stop music, it. loves to have fun. So I was trying to be cool at South by Southwest, and I am not cool. Like not <laughs> at all. So I call Kyle and I say, you know, can we draft off of you at South by Southwest? But another so I'll talk about that in a second, because Kyle knows how to throw a party. But another way I tried to be cool at South by Southwest was, so I issued, I issued a press release. And if you search really hard, you can find this press release. We were trying to, you know, break through the noise. And my brilliant idea was let's kind of spoof the bro culture of South by Southwest. And let's just create the most obnoxious press release that's ever been written and see what happens. So we write this press release. It's like, you know, Acquia brings record expense accounts to South by Southwest. And we you know, we talked about how we're going to make it rain. We talked about bottomless Red Bull and vodka. We talked about grabbing a pig, uh, grabbing something in the notorious PIG, one of the big places there. It was just like this insiders only press release that you would only know if you went to South by Southwest and you would like, we were assuming people would get the fact it's called like Acquia brings record expense report. To South yeah, by South. I'm this. trying to Google yeah, okay, for it. It's still it. there. Yeah. Yeah. And I was trying to be funny. We were trying to be like sarcastic, like the onion. And it went over 
like an absolute disaster because of course it wasn't taken as you're trying to parody the bro culture. It is you are perpetuating every horrible stereotype that exists about tech. I spent the next day like personally apologizing on Twitter to everybody. You know, I worked in the open source Drupal community who are very inclusive right. by nature, which was also made it even worse. Yeah, you needed like a crisis comms plan for your own press release. My own, yeah, no, I was, the, and we had no crisis comms plan. I was, I was the crisis comms plan. It started controversy inside the company because some people thought it was funny and got the joke, a lot didn't. The CEO and the founder of Drupal approved it, but others didn't. It was this like really terrible moment. So I tried to be cool. That failed miserably. I did pull off being cool though with Kyle's party. So he threw a party where it was bare hands. Who was there? Or some? Uh, no. Uh, no um, uh, uh, Deer Tick. Deer Tick. Uh, Lumineers. Deer Tick. Lumineers. Jaws. They played our party at Gill. I wish so we, we go to other, like yeah. this. You know, we just put a little. I write Kyle a check. Put up a little Aquia logo. And all of a sudden, our you know all of our employees go there. Think Aqui is actually a cool company. Has nothing to do with Aqui or my marketing. Just slap a logo on the stuff that Kyle does. So lesson there: if you want to be cool, just sort of pick Kyle's brain a little bit. But that South by Southwest was fascinating. Almost ended my marketing career, but I feel like I was redeemed. And by the way, one more point: we we're standing in the airport a line waiting to get a taxi. It's always a huge line at South by Southwest we heard somebody talking about our press release. So that nice. was the part of it that it actually probably did somewhat accomplish what we were hoping right. to do. It was some digital agency who were talking about these guys who wrote this press release. I'm like, that was me. So anyway. Well, by That's the way, I thought, cool. I thought you were gonna also tell like um, that oh, I know party. That. Yeah, that party continue, uh, continue. late night, really late. Like, you know, these things the, with the bars close at two there. So like the last band goes on to like midnight or whatever. Um, we're like literally hanging out in the VIP and one of my sales, one of my sales reps from Dine runs over. He's like, Kyle, Kyle. And he's with this woman and he's like, uh, Werner Vogels is here to see you. Yeah, exactly. And it's two in the morning and I'm like slammed. Right. Like I've been like, you know, drinking since this our parties where they started at like four. I mean, it's like ridiculous. It was like a marathon, you know, like concert festival basically. And so, uh, I proceeded to like drink beers and, you know, hang out with Werner Vogels for like, till like four in the morning. Um, and he, you know, he was sniffing around a dime, right? It was, they, Amazon was Dine's biggest customer. They were also our biggest competitor. I'm sure lots of folks can relate uh, to this dynamic these days. Um, and, you know, the CTO uh, came to our party on our VIP list, showed up a little late, um, but it was, it was the kind of, that was the magic that happened at South by all the time. But that is a great up. story. That is a fucking great story. The PR that you did is ballsy. So congrats. Well, it was know, in I, retrospect. I didn't know my audience. Like, if I, I'd sorry, if I'd been clear internally that this is look, we're doing this. I still think I would have it would have not gone over well, but it might have been at least acceptable. We just dropped that on the world with no context. People just thought Aquia were a bunch of assholes, and it was. But again, I was actually looking at it yesterday. Believe it or not, for some reason. I think it still stands up as funny. It was for what it was intended to be a complete parody. It was funny. The bottomless Red Bulls, it, like those are just. It was. Please, a, please do share share a link. Uh, you know, well, it is it is the the situation that many times very intelligent people tell a joke and no one understands that joke besides the, you know, a few people around them. But uh, I think it's very ballsy. And you know, normally they say that no no marketing is bad marketing. So I hope. That, uh, that that was the way it was taken. You won't be drinking Pabst Blue Ribbon while you're hanging with the Aquia team unless you're a hipster and that's what you drink. Whether it's in the halls <laughs> of the ACC, the back patio with the ginger man, or tucking into a notorious PIG at Frank at 1 a.m. Come on. Ah, it's you know, so I, eloquent. I did write. I wrote Kyle Hipster because I couldn't believe that you made... So cheers. It's Yo, awesome. Kyle's about as hipster as it gets. I mean, the dude Listen, knows every I'm indie a, band. I may, ever. you know, I know. I'm, I'm super I'm, glad I'm, I shaved my beard because, like, <laughs> I would have been crushed. And I'm really glad I didn't wear my Live Free or Die New Hampshire shirt because I would have been even more crushed on this color. I'm wearing a uh, I may shirt. not have a good understanding of what a hipster is uh, because, in my uh, terminology, Kyle is not a hipster. He's more of a classic Bostonian kid than than a hipster. But, you much. know, but I, but I, I don't know, you know. I Anyone who likes relative. good music, if you like yeah. good music, you're a hipster. I guess that sets it. You know, if you like indie music, no one else has ever heard of. Kyle's your guy. Ah, 
Okay, that's good to know. I didn't realize that about Kyle. It's, it's, it's an attribute for sure. Let, let's go back for a second. Um, since you started Kyle York, is there, a, is there a company that or a CEO or a founder that came to you and asked for investment that you maybe haven't invested in that you really regret, that you look back and like, shit, I fucked up on that one. I should have definitely invested in that person. You know, it's kind of funny. So York IE is... We founded it in September of 19. So we're like 18 months into that. But I've been angel investing since before I was definitely accredited. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I just started doing it with small 10K checks, you know, 5K checks, 15K checks. I have plenty where, you know, I didn't invest and I got some like advisor shares and then I exercised my advisor shares. Like Fastly is a great example. You know, I was, a, it's a public company worth $10 yep. billion. Dollars. You know, I... I got the opportunity to early invest. I didn't invest because I was being cheap. I got a little teeny advisory equity. I, I, I you know, exercised it for $13,250. And on my last sale in the public markets, it was a 270X, you know? Would have been pretty nice if I manned up and put 25 <laughs> or 50K in the company like two years before that, right? Um, so there's lots of those stories where like maybe I was still involved in some way and like don't regret it that badly. I don't have any like like so far because we're so new in York IE where like there's definitely some of like you know they, they, they like raise not from us from someone else and then they have a great follow-on markup and I'm like there's one called aid identified this this happened to where I was over valuation sensitive on their seed round and then just raised a grade a round right um, but you know it's been pretty rare honestly so far um, I think part of it's because we do we see about 75 deals a month and we do one a month right so we're still doing a bunch of deals um, and you got to kind of get through the gauntlet uh, to sort of get there and I try not to live with regrets it anyway but come back to me on that in a couple of years there's certainly there certainly will be I mean crap I almost I almost didn't invest in you right I mean I was crapping on you about the Martech space and how, <laughs> how cluttered it was and You guys were kind of just figuring out your GTM motion and the scalability, rounding out your go-to-market teams. We were introduced from Mark Organ from Eloqua. I know he's been on, on uh, in, in, in a bunch of other great companies over the years he's been on. Um, you know, so like I have a lot of like, you know, last minute effort. Let's just do it. Like, why are we overanalyzing this? And I'm really like Finmark's when we did, Auditoria's when we did. Um, you know, that are like doing great follow ons, big rounds, customers coming in, the cliners coming in, those types of things. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question, but I think I'm going to have a lot more of an unportfolio as we progress. Look, you already answered the next question I had. Uh, what in, in one, just one sentence or, or just like one point, what did make you invest? It's like, this sounds like a very small percentage, right? It's like a 1%. You invest in 1% of the companies you meet a month. So yeah. What was the reason you invested in, in a company like Metadata? Did you see the 12 billion dollar or did you see the 50 million ARR? Uh, we're, we're, we're interesting. I mean, we're, we are far more of a pragmatic investor. Like, like because I'm not a fund that I'm a syndicate model and he, so I get that five-year pledge, that annual commit. So I in essence have like a budget every six months. It's rolling, right? It's evergreen. So you know when I look at it, I'm like, I'm just stacking companies up against the companies I see. At that given time and you know from my perspective i look at it more like is this a company that will put a win in the win column like is this a company that won't fail like i find the startup investing space to be such bullshit. like like it's such power law with vc funds right like every investment they make a, a tier one vc they have i mean now it's not even a unicorn now they have they're chasing only companies they believe can be decacorns right And it's like, at the end of the day, like I've made tons of investments over the year that have been $25 million exits, $60 million exits, $80 million exits, life-changing for entrepreneurs, for teams, the learnings of these people, the wealth created. You know, I have companies sold for 20 million, but the founder owned 85%. Like, like he's good, man. He's happy. He hasn't worked in four years. He's 34 years old, you know? <laughs> um, so I just think we look at the world a little bit differently. And when I see companies... Like metadata, you know, certainly there's ones with far greater upside, but I still think it needs to be unlocked on that path. So it's a little bit of everything. It's, it's clearly all the, all the things that everyone invests in. But I, you know, I think we're playing a little bit of a different game on that. 
I think that's fascinating. And it's my job to get you to answer this question clearly on the 12, 12 billion answer next time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but this is exactly, I think, the, I think this is a very honest answer. And I think, you know, last week I was talking to, two, to a CRO and a CMO in both unicorn companies. And they were talking about technical founders as the ones who create the product, make the innovation, are technologists who have no fucking clue you know, the, 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 even the potential of their, their invention and when to take that bat and say, okay, I'm ready. I actually think this could be a 12 billion company. And I think that's not, a, that's a, a subject that is not discussed enough. Yeah. There are many technical founders who are very pragmatic, paranoid, did not grow up into money. I have no idea what is the visa route even is. And they build a product and a company that is super defensive, that can survive recessions, that has innovation, but they don't even know how to play that game. They don't even know how to talk about it the way someone else who is building a vaporware can easily sell a $10 billion company. And they would never make that leap if it's not for someone who is investing in their company or is joining a company. I have the, the real fortune, and I say it zero cliche aside, of having people like Olivier, Clay, yeah. Jason, who are not originally from my camp. You know, these are right, people yeah. who come from a different environment. Right. And, but they saw something that I didn't even see in the company. And they yeah. jump immediately. And they are very patient with my character, engineering, conservative uh, characteristic. And they're like, this is going to be huge. Yeah, but you're a good example of what I just said. I mean, you, like, you've been at this a little while. And Four the. Years. Yeah, and the and the growth and the opportunity has really been in the last two, where it's really started to accelerate. And actually, honestly, last summer it was like, I wonder if they're even going to snip their this year's numbers, right? Um, so, so again, I think I think like that that's the story of Webflow. By the way, they've been around since like 2014. It wasn't even until like a year ago, yeah. all of a sudden, they catch lightning in a bottle. And so again, I don't think current venture capital climate uh, lends itself to that patience and that pragmatism. To then say, okay, now let's pour fuel in the fire and go for it when we unlock that opportunity. It's always like we can fund that un we fund that unlock before it actually happens. And I again I just think that that works for some but not others. And then we celebrate all the outliers. But really, like, let's celebrate a lot of bootstrap companies and companies who can raise less money to get to 100 million ARR. You know, like like you just don't hear about it or or the $50 million exit. Like I would love to see cap tables of $50 million exits and compare it. I mean, when we sold Dime, for example, Aaron Levy from Box and I basically had the same amount of equity, right? I joined Dine 10 years after it's, the community project was started as its chief revenue officer. Aaron Levy found that it is like sophomore year in college, right? And in the end, you know, we both had around the same amount of equity in the company he founded, the company I joined 10 years late, right? So again, just different, it's different strokes. Now he did, he, you know, he did great, you know, but I did fine too, you know? And so I guess my point is, is like, you know, if, if they're not all created equal, we should stop comparing all of ourselves to the snowflakes and the, you know, splunks and the, you know, it's like, that's all well and good, but not everyone's going to unlock that magic. No, but there's a lot of great exits that happen along the way, you know? Tom. I was going to say, Kyle, and Kyle's written this post I read, there's great $40 million exits. There's great $50 million exits. Snowflake has to have that kind of exit when you raise eight hundred million dollars, whatever crazy number that was. When um when we sold Dime like three months later, Simplicity sold to HPE, and it was like twenty five million dollars more than the rumored exit of Dime's price. And I had people pinging me because a couple former diners had gone and worked there over there. Oh, you must be pissed. You you know bigger New England exit than yours, like same quarter, whatever, like. I'm like, their last private valuation was a $1.2 billion valuation and they just sold for six forty or whatever, right? You know how many people lost there? How many options were underwater? Like, like they're just not all created equal is my point. And all we see is the, te the tech crunch headlines, you know, the, the top yeah, line headlines. You, and you see the numerator, not the denominator. You don't totally. see all the data. It's hard to assess something until you see it on paper. And um it's great to celebrate the snowflakes, but those are once a generation kinds of companies. And we set them as the benchmark. Realistically, there's, there's going to be one of those every 10 years, 20 years. It's not going to happen for most companies. You better I, find I, another I way to build a business. 
it's true and it's funny because i uh when, in last week in the previous episode we were talking about those 50x 60x uh valuation that are happening today in SaaS. legit companies in 7 million arr getting around for like 40x and 50x and uh my my you know i always thought about it like the moment you raise around on a 50x there is a gun to your head and you have to <laughs> you have to basically you have to grow up into that valuation immediately and you know what this is my conservative thinking and that is one thing i think is sometimes being missed because there are limiting thoughts a technical founder that did not grow up in silicon valley has limiting thoughts they are happy very happy with a 20 million 50 million exit if they own 50 percent plus but that could be a mistake. I mean, if they're already on the path on being venture backed, they already are comfortable with the fact that they are going to give up portions of their company and growing. Right. They, if there is someone there to unlock that thought and tell them, like, stop thinking small, hmm. you are legitimately on to something big. Let's calculate your TAM conservatively. You have at least a billion dollar ARR in your horizon. If you don't fuck everything up, like you always assume you're going to, what is your you're really I think that's I think that's a fair point, Gil. But I think it, it stresses like binary outcomes, like success or failure. Like you know, it's really hard to catch up to that valuation, right? If there's any constraints in multiples, or if your growth rate, you know, constrains to twenty percent a year, or you know, like you're burning cash on fire at the same time your growth rate constrains, or you know, you have some doomsday event. I mean, at Dime, we had this the world's worst DDoS attack on our network, literally the day we signed our LOI with Oracle. <laughs> I, thought, I thought like literally all my on paper net worth was gone, you know, that day, right? So I think I think it's just what what the current venture capital climate in Silicon Valley stresses is that the customer of the venture capital firm is the LP. And to get outlier upper quartile returns, they need to be playing venture power law. I, mean, I just saw a blog post yesterday, the Babe Ruth effect in venture capital. It was about how Babe Ruth said that the way he hit more home runs than anyone else is he swung as hard as he could at every ball, which we <laughs> all know the guy had like the best hand-eye coordination in like the history of like sport. But that was just a quote he used. And Andreessen was literally saying that's what venture has become. Right. It's like you have to swing for the decacorns every single time. And again, that's fine for the ones who win. But again, a lot of companies might not make it and be actual losers for that fund to be caught up by the winners. And I, again, I just don't know if that's really the right health for the entrepreneur. I, I'm not saying you need the bootstrap or sell for 20 million and you're good. But I just think it's the, it's still maintaining the level of pragmatism to, you know, as you're creating your category, as the category unlocks to preserve optionality is the way I'll kind of end it. Like if you can preserve optionality on your path, that a it can be a success, even if it's not grand slam home run in the bottom of the night, um, that's good too, right? I think that's very healthy, very healthy comment. Before we, before we end, what is, if you had one, one advice from your position, from your experience, one advice for a founder who just finished their Series A yeah. investment and they, they, maybe they checked on their go-to-market fit. They have all kinds of options to Kyle's, uh, to Kyle's comment. You know, they have all kinds of optionality in front of them and they're going into the next stage. What, are, what is the, the one thing, the, the two things that you would highly encourage them to take a look at before they, before they march into their Series B, into their exit, yeah. into their next, next stage? Well, if you want two things, you got to pay me. But for one thing, I'll give you some free advice. And I know Kyle is going to agree with this because this is how he built his business. The biggest mistake I made in my career was under investing in brand. You know, I was, I'm a math guy. It's easy for me to reverse engineer a funnel and focus on the things that need to happen in a quarter to get me enough pipeline for the next quarter. But I never until Recorded Future thought about what does my business need to do two years from now? And Recorded Future is going to be a billion dollar company plus, you know, in a few years. So I put probably now a third of my time into things that aren't going to impact my pipeline tomorrow, next month, next quarter, even think about brand, think about making investments today that you can't prove, but that you know, are going to be the kinds of things that as you're a much bigger company, that you're going to want to have those things in place. Acquia would have gone public had I not totally. made that mistake. 
I love that. That is exactly the kind of advice. I would and give. honestly, Thank I you. think doing it over again, Dine would have too. I think, I think we invested in it really early. And I think once we started to raise capital later and we started to get more constraints on managing those analytics and managing the dollars and cents is actually when we started to like get scared. And it was because we were first time founders. It was, we were first time leaders. We didn't know better. Right. So I, I think it's just beat that drum every single day, evangelize, amplify till you're blue in the face. I love that you said that, Tom, that's like, that's like an admittance of like a decade of discussion right there. I was, and I was wrong. Like I really felt like it hurt my own personal net worth that I made that mistake. I will never make that mistake again. That's beautiful. Kyle, did you just, uh, did you just confirm uh, Tom's point or do you have a, a different advice from, from your position to, to founders who just finished their series A and are, are thinking about the two kind of paths they have in front of them. And one thing that you would choose to do to either figure out that path or to, to, to maximize yeah, I won't, yeah, I won't cop want. out. I won't cop out. This is something actually I talked to Olivia a lot, uh, your president. Um, you really need to start planning in 24 month windows, not a year. Everyone has a three to five year model, right? It's like just kind of make believe, but you really need to start planning beyond the current fiscal year you're in. Because when you start to scale sales teams and quota models, the ramp times and the assumptions you've made historically and, you know, rep ratios to BDRs and SEs and managers and, and how many leads inbound, outbound breakdowns, like everything changes as the, as you need to feed more bodies, right? It's always like, are you lead constrained or are you feed constrained? So I always just challenge companies at the stage of like growth equity raising and like expansion stage and getting 10 million ARR and beyond. You got to have multi-year planning that's actually like tied to execution operationally, not just what you put in the pitch deck, right? It yeah. actually has to be put into practice. Yeah, that's, I think that's that's great advice. You, as a shareholder, you'll be happy to hear that we are actually doing that. Uh, I think twenty-four months. You better once, be your own, you once. Know? Once you believe, <laughs> you know, I I think once you believe that the twenty-four months is happening, then you stop bullshitting. Then you're actually going back. And you're like, wait, are we actually guaranteeing this this end of 2022 is happening? And that's when you uh, follow. You can advice. sense the conviction in a founder and CEO's voice. That's what I meant earlier. Like, like founders, CEOs, executives know how their company's doing and what they can do over the next couple of years. I think five years, yeah. I mean, it's like who the hell knows, right? <laughs> I think like if you can get good at like 18, 24 months, like book it. You know, yeah, that's what we're doing, right? Like, because again, you have more data at that scale. Um, to be a lot more, a lot more tight about that plan. Gentlemen, I really had the pleasure learning from you both and chatting with you both. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kyle. Cheers one more time before you go Cheers. to your soccer. Thank you for having us. The rest of the weekend. Baseball. It's baseball. Baseball. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you both. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. Great to see you. Thanks again for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed today's discussion and will tune in again. Find all of the B2B Category Creators episodes at metadata.io. And if you have any feedback, topics, or would like to be a guest on the show, please reach out.